when I was on my bike, it did give me an amazing sense of freedom. And nobody could touch me and nobody could stop me. It just sort of empowered me. My name is Elspeth Beard and I'm the first British woman to go around the world on a motorbike. When I was 23, I rode my bike around the world for just over two years. I left in 1982, travelling 35,000 miles through 20 countries. In those days, it didn't even occur to anybody for a second that it, it would be a woman riding a bike. So when I was actually riding the bike and I was fully dressed in all my gear, I felt quite safe. Australia was so weird in the outback. I would ride for sort of three or four hundred miles with nothing. You'd come to a roadhouse and you'd walk into this bar and literally it was like a sort of scene from a film. You know, everybody would just kind of stop dead. They'd all turn around and look at you. And in some places they didn't even serve me. So I'd go outside and drink water from a tap. I did find the whole trip quite isolating and I got incredibly lonely. I would pick up mail every three months and that was the only contact I had with home and friends and family. But then it was great. I'd rush to the post office, it was a really, you know, I used to love it and I'd get this whole stack of letters and I'd get like three months news and I'd, and I'd go somewhere and I'd sit there for, for hours just reading through all this, savouring all of the news. One of the travellers that I met was a Dutch guy called Robert. It suddenly became almost a holiday from what it had been when I was travelling on my own. We met in Kathmandu. We travelled together through Rajasthan, up through Kashmir, Leh and Ladakh. And it was actually up in Kashmir that we fell in love. Iran was at war with Iraq. There were lots of tanks and soldiers, and there were roadblocks every 50 or 100 miles. We had this ridiculous situation where we'd changed dollars on the black market. We got five and a half times what we would have got. But we would go to these Western hotels and we'd be sh shoot out of the door. No, 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 you can't stay here. Can't. As if they were frightened that we would be seen. And a lot of the time we would be sleeping on the side of the road some countries I couldn't even get maps for because they just didn't exist. I used to have to go to these kind of tourist places and just get little local maps and I had to kind of join them all up so I could kind of work out where the hell I was trying to go. Getting lost and finding your way again is part of the adventure. Whereas if you are following a red line on a screen, all those opportunities don't exist. They're sort of taken away. The trip completely changed me as a person, completely. You really are pushed to the absolute limit and it makes you grow. It just makes you stronger and you know, and you can take anything on. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Rob Rennie. I'm one of the Brooklyn's Trust Talks team members. And it's a great pleasure tonight to follow that little intro with a much more detailed talk. Please will you give a very warm welcome to Elizabeth Elspeth Beard. Uh, thank you. Oh, you can hear me. Very good. Um, thank you very much. Um, right, so, so I'm actually starting uh, the talk today. Uh, this is actually, this is actually a picture that was um, taken when I got back from my trip in uh, 1984, which might seem like a slightly odd place to start, but um, I actually owe uh, a lot to this image. Um, it, uh, basically, when I got back in 1984, um, absolutely nobody wanted to know about my trip. Um, I contacted Bike Magazines, the press, and just nobody wanted to know about it, um, which was fine, because that wasn't, you know, I mean, I'd done it for myself. But, um, and then, 
I, and then in 2008, so literally I just put all my diaries, photos, everything in, in a box, which is where they stayed for sort of 28 years. And nobody knew, apart from my friends and family, nobody knew about my, you know, my uh, trip at all. Um, and then in 2008, uh, a friend of mine was speaking to somebody at uh, BMW, and um, and he mentioned my trip. And so they said, "Well, would he write a, a sort of short article?" Uh, and so he wrote the article, which was put up on their international website. And as part of the article, this uh, image was was. Uh, was sort of the you know the main image, and there was something about this picture which seemed to capture people's imagination, and this picture was shared and blogged, and my story kind of spread around, uh, completely oblivious to me. I had absolutely no idea this was going on, and uh, and then it was uh, in 2014, uh, I was contacted completely out of the blue uh, by this agent in Ho in um, Hollywood who wanted to buy the rights to my story to make a film. So I'd gone from nobody wanting to know anything to Hollywood wanting to make a film, so it was all very strange. But uh, I was flown out to um, 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 uh, LA and I saw the, you know, the screenwriters and, and, and producers and things. But I think then I realized that the first thing I needed to do, because I hadn't looked or read it through any of my diaries for you know, nearly by then, 30 years, and I couldn't, I mean, I could remember my, you know, I'm in the rough places I went to, but all the details of my journey I couldn't remember at all. So I decided that, um, that people were in, interested in what I'd done, so maybe I should write a book. So I kind of said thanks, but no thanks to Hollywood, and I said I'll, I'll write my book first, because I wanted to be a sort of accurate, uh, you know, uh, you know, Thing of what I had actually done that I had that I'd written rather than you know Hollywood you know trying to make a whatever story they were going to try and make out of it. So I, I returned um, back and then I spent two and a half years um, basically writing my book, which was published in uh, 2017. Um, and the and I've been told that this image is, has become an iconic image, or whatever that means, which I find very hard to believe. Um, but last year, uh, a friend of mine sent me uh, this picture, which they took in TK Maxx in Bristol. <laughs> and it turned out that uh, an Italian clothing company had rather taken the fancy to this picture, and they were selling this all over Europe without even asking me. So I... I sued them and I won. So. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't have minded, they just should have asked me. Um, so anyway, so how did it all begin? Well, I suppose it probably started when I was expelled from school, when I was about 16. Um, well, it was halfway through my A-levels and, um, and I, I was sent to a sort of um, a college in London uh, to finish them off and, and at this college I kind of met this group of bikers and that's really when I started to, or that's really when I first rode uh, a, a bike. So when I was 17 uh, I needed some transport to get around London so I bought myself my first bike in 1977 which was a 100cc Yamaha YB100 and it was brilliant. I had fantastic fun. They sort of race all over London and uh, it was cheap, it was efficient, it was, fun. it was brilliant. I loved it. But after a year of that I got a bit bored so I bought myself a 250, and in those days you could ride a bike up to 250cc without uh, having to pass a test. Um, but I passed my test on the 250, and then uh, a year later I got a bit bored with that, so then I decided to buy myself my BMW uh, R60-6. Uh, it was a 1974. So, and I bought it in 1979, so it was already quite old when I bought it. Um, and it was really this bike that made me realise the sort of travelling potential of a motorbike. Um, I, I just had this amazing uh, sense of freedom. I could go where I want. I could. Just, it was just brilliant. Um, so I did the first trip I did was up to Scotland. Uh, then I rode around Ireland. Then I think the following summer I rode around Europe. And then in the summer of 91, 
uh, I flew out to Los Angeles and I bought an old BMW 750, R75 stroke 5, and I rode it from the West Coast uh, to the East Coast. And it was somewhere on that journey, um, I, I, I got this kind of mad idea, thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually ride a motorbike around the world? And I know now that seems a bit dark, because of course we all know you can, but you know, then the world seemed a much, much larger place, and you couldn't find out about countries, you know, it, it was, and I didn't even know whether, I, you know, it, it was actually possible to sort of do it. But anyway, this slightly mad thought came into my head, and then I obviously I never, never imagined I would actually do it. Um, and it was actually the combination of things that happened to me the following year. Uh, I, by this stage, I'd, I'd done my, well, I was doing my first three years uh, architecture training. And um, and I was and it was I was in my final year, and when I was at college, I met and fell in love with this with this guy called Alex, and he um, decided to end our relationship about two months before my finals, and I was incredibly uh, upset and brokenhearted, and I, as a consequence of it, I found it really hard to work. And I did really bad in, badly in my exams, and I ended up with a third class degree. Um, and I just, and so I was questioning whether whether architecture was for me, whether I should carry on with it because it's like a seven-year course, so it's a long it's a long haul to you know to get the the final um, uh, sort of, um, uh, exam done. So. I decided I know what I'll do. I'll go and try and ride my bike around the world, as you do. So I then spent, I got a job in the, uh, this was the local, as you can see, I was uh, not the happiest of people at the time. Um, but I got a job in the pub there. Um, well, I used to work from eight in the morning till uh, midnight, seven days a week. Uh, which I did uh, for three months, and uh, I basically saved every penny. I think I was earning like one pound seventy-five an hour, if I remember, which was, oh, it was, it was painful. Um, but I did manage to save two and a half thousand pounds uh, in the three months. Um, and during this time, I tried to contact bike magazines and get some interest uh, and get some sponsorship. I sort of offered. So I wrote to uh, quite a few of the bike magazines. Uh, I sent this photograph and I sent a letter uh, saying, you know, that maybe I could, I could write and they could publish my, my story in sections and people could follow me around. And Anyway, uh, I wrote about 30 letters. I got two replies. Uh, one I got from BMW in Munich, which was very, very polite basically saying, um, we already know our bikes are the best, so we don't actually need to sponsor anybody, but best of, best of luck. <laughs> Hope you have a good trip. Um, and then the only response I got from the British press was this lovely letter from Bike Magazine, which you might not be able to read, so I'll read it. It says, Dear Elspeth, Brecken said he'd, uh, he'd write this letter, but he can't because his tongue's jammed his typewriter. Julian asks if you've got an eight foot tall husband who's also a karate expert. Mike Clements has already formed the Elspeth Beard Appreciation Society and wants to know where in the world you're going to be so he can be there first. Me, I'd like to offer you sponsorship around the world, but I think it would be a waste and a shame for London. Best wishes, Dave Coldwood. So fortunately, I was not disheartened um, with that sort of attitude. Uh, I think actually the thing that annoyed me the most about it was the fact that he took so much trouble to reply at all. Um, it would have been better if he'd just thrown my letter and thing in, a, in, in the bin. And not, but the fact he actually went to a huge amount of effort to, to, to write that, and, and, and it's in the days where you actually had had to type it, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and take it to a post box. It wasn't just like you know, sending off a quick email. Um, but anyway, so I ignored that, and I decided to prepare my bike uh, the best I could. Um, as I say, when I left, my bike was eight years old, 
and it had 45,000 miles on it already at the beginning. So she was a fairly well used bike. So I decided to, I bought myself a Haynes manual and uh, some tools. And I decided to strip her down and learn uh, as much about her as I could. And in the process, I replaced all the gaskets and the seals. I put new cables, battery tires, anything I could think of that would um, obviously save me ha having to do things along the way. Um, and it was a great learning exercise. Um, you know, I learned a lot about my, my bike. And I think for me, that was really important. I, I'd, I don't like... Uh, riding bikes I don't know or understand and I think because one of the fears for me when I was on the road was was you know was was just breaking down in the middle of nowhere and just not being able, able to sort of fix it and if you if you know that you know everything about your bike then you just don't ha have that fear at all and so for me it was really important so I knew my bike reasonably well. Um, this was the list of spare parts, which I just kind of made up. Because, um, of course, in those days, you couldn't buy books telling you what to do and how to do it and what to take. And so this was my list of spare parts, which I took uh, with me, which I have to say was pretty good. There wasn't a lot on it um, that I wish I had that I didn't have. So, so the route I took. So because I'd, I'd, I'd ridden across America the year before, and I had this limited amount of money. I knew that the two, or I hoped, certainly hoped that the two, two and a half thousand pounds I had would be enough to get me uh, across America to, to New Zealand uh, or Australia where I hoped I could work. And I, I mean, I knew there's no way I was going to get, but I was fairly confident I would be able to do that. So I shipped my bike to New York, uh, went up into Canada a bit, down to New Orleans, across to Los Angeles then to New Zealand, and then I arrived in Sydney. And when I arrived in Sydney, I literally I had $50 left. I mean, I was completely broke. Um, and I, um, I got two jobs in Sydney. I worked there for seven months. And then I left uh, Sydney, rode up uh, through Queensland, across the middle of Australia, down to Port Augusta, to Perth, then up through uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. I went right up to the northern bit of Thailand, and I was hoping to get to get um, um, across Burma to India, but all the borders were shut. So then I had to ride back down to Penang, take a, sh uh, a boat across to uh, uh, India, and then ride up to Calcutta to Kathmandu, and then back into India, Leh and Ladakh, and then through Pakistan, Iran, uh, Turkey, and then Greece, Yugoslavia, uh, Europe, and back to London. So I did 35,000 miles uh, in just over two and a half years. So this was my parents taking me to the airport. You see, I was rather happy. They were less so. Um, and my parents um, had a very strange attitude towards my trip. Um, I, obviously, they just didn't understand it at all. Um, they were both medics. They were both doctors. And so my mum hated motorbikes with a vengeance. She couldn't stand them. I think she'd done a spell in A&E when she was doing her house jobs. And so she'd seen all these injured motorcyclists coming in. So she was sort of, you know, she absolutely hated motorbikes. Um, and she did everything she could do to stop me from going. Um, and my dad, well, my dad was a slightly odd character. He was a psychiatrist, uh, very eccentric and tended to live in his own world most of the time. So he didn't really say anything at all, so it was slightly bizarre. But anyway, I, I, um, they took me to the airport and I managed to get to, uh, over to America. And, these, and this picture actually is my first days uh, on the road uh, in America. I literally, I'd just ridden out, out of New York having picked up my bike. And as you can see, when I left, I just had sort of soft fold-over panniers with a bag tied on it and a tank bag, and that was it. Uh, this was in White Sands Na National Park uh, in New Mexico. So I managed to get across America. Um, I went to New Zealand, uh, and then I arrived uh, in Sydney. And this is where I lived in Sydney. It was actually a, a sort of garage, which I did up. I found all, all the furniture on the side of the street 
and I just kind of made it all and I got a job and it cost me $20. For $20 a month, I think. It was really cheap. Um, and I could keep my bike with me in the garage, so it was perfect. So um, it was cheap, and, anyway, so I, and I got two jobs. I, I got a job as an architect's assistant during the day, and then I worked, uh, I worked in a pub most evenings of the week and weekend, so it was pretty full on. Um, because I had a very limited time in order to uh, earn as much money as I could to get home. And I had absolutely no idea how much it was going to cost me to get home. I mean, in those days, you couldn't talk to anybody. You couldn't get advice from anybody. It was, you just had to kind of... So, so I literally just had to earn as much as I could. And I saved every single penny I could. Um, and when I was in Sydney, I met this guy called John Todd. And John was an extraordinary guy. And... He persuaded me that all my soft luggage, which I had used across America, would not be good enough for where I was going. All these countries, all Southeast Asia and India, all my luggage, everything would get stolen and it had to be lockable. And so he persuaded me that I needed to make myself some serious aluminium panniers. So with his guidance and help, I spent three months, every weekend for three months, basically building my own, um, my own panniers and top box. And it was literally just angle bits of aluminium, and it was just, just you know, it was a sheet of the aluminium just r riveted on. Um, and then at the end of the three months, I was this very proud owner of this very stylish, stylish luggage system. Um, I know it's hard to believe looking at that that I have actually become an award-winning architect, but... Um, <laughs> But in fact, it was brilliant. It was, it was cheap, it was, uh, it, it was light, it was waterproof, and it was easy to repair. It just didn't look very pretty, but it was very, very practical. Um, and it was funny, I remember when I first met John, uh, the, first, the, the first day I went to see him or meet him, and he said, would I like to see his bike? Uh, that's right, John, John had ridden his bike from Australia to Europe and back, I think. And he was, he was, as I say, he was quite an extraordinary uh, person. And he said, would I like to see his bike? So I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to. So we walked out to the, this shed at the back of his garden. Uh, and we got to the door, and, and, and he opened the door. And just before he switched the light on, he said, appearances don't mean anything to me. And then that's what I thought. <laughs> And it really was quite extraordinary. Um, sadly, John now has passed away um, about 10 years ago, but his bike is in a museum uh, somewhere in Australia. I can't remember where, but it's somewhere in a museum in Australia. And, uh, and underneath that, there was a BMW 60 stroke 2, I think, 1964. Um, so, but it really was, and he obviously crafted it, and that's what he wanted to turn my bike into. So actually, <laughs> actually, I think I did pretty well. So, so I just stop him with it. So after seven months, I, uh, I, was, I had my panniers, I had my money, and I was good to, I was good to, um, to go. So I, I, I set off around Australia. Um, and Australia, for some reason, I thought was going to be I don't know, easy, riding into the sunset, you know, beautiful roads. Um, and it was absolute hell. It was the, I think it was one of the hardest countries, the most inhospitable countries. Uh, I rode, um, uh, you know, I rode through. It was just, it was like everything sort of conspired against me. It was the, it was the, it was the, you know, the dust, the heat, the flies, the kangaroos, the cows, the roadworks, the... The, the mud, the, the, the rain, it was, just, it was just relentless. And it was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles I had to ride day after day after day. And I found it physically and mentally exhausting. And it was just hundreds of miles of nothing. Um, I mean, fortunately here I, well, and, and actually when I was riding through Queensland, I had my first um, accident, my first big accident. Um, and fortunately, I just literally two days beforehand met up with this other bike 
uh, being ridden by Tom, this English guy, and uh, Ewan, who was a Kiwi, who was hitching a lift uh, on the back of Tom's bike. So we had literally met up two days beforehand, so they were riding behind me, and it was, it was on a dirt road, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere, and my front wheel just went into this pothole, and it just kind of jammed in it, and then the whole back of the bike flipped over, and I just cartwheeled down the road, and I kind of landed on my head, and I had, con you know, con Cushion. I was in hospital for about seven days, I think. Um, so that was my first sort of bag. Anyway, but then, you know, I picked myself up. I, I fixed my bike. Uh, I mean, it, unfortunately, it landed on my top box, and my top box was almost flattened like a concertina. <laughs> so I had to pull it all straight. Um, and, and then I sort of continued uh, 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 on my journey. But it really was just days and days and days and days of that, just nothing. Um, and then when I got into central Australia, and I was riding down through from Alice to Port Augusta, uh, they had more rain in one night than they'd had in seven years. Um, and it was actually the story of my trip. Wherever I went, it was, oh, it's, it's the wettest it's ever been. It's the windiest it's ever been. It's the coldest it's ever been. It hasn't been like this for 20 years. Everywhere I went, I was told that. Um, but anyway, so, so, I, I, so, so after I left Alice, uh, the road, I mean, it just turned into a lake. And uh, you could barely stand up in it. I mean, when you, I mean, the mud was almost up to your knees. So there's no way I could ride a bike in it. So I managed to hitch a, to put my bike in the back of a road train in a trailer, and I, I, and I hitched a ride. And this was, this was a, that's the main road. Um, and so I managed to hitch this 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 um, ride, and it took us nearly four or five days to do 300 miles. And the road train just got bogged down all the time. So we were constantly getting out, digging it out, winching it out. Uh, taking one trailer off, and it was just, it was a, it was a whole adventure in itself. Um, but, um, so, anyway, I managed to get to Port, Port Augusta, uh, and then I started the long ride uh, across the, uh, across the Nullarbor, across to Perth, which is about 1,500 miles, I think, of literally that, just a treeless plain. And it was actually when I was riding uh, across the Nullarbor was when I had my, well, the first probably major problem with my bike. Uh, I was riding along and all this smoke started to come up from under the tank, which is not very good. And um, so I kind of jumped off the bike. I didn't really know what to do. Um, and then I just, I think I just took my, something I was wearing and I stuffed it under the tank, hoping that it would, it would sort of, you know, the fire would die down. And um, anyway, it sort of turned out that all my, my entire, um, you know, it's a loo, my, 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 my electrics was burnt out from the centre of the bike to the whole of the front end of the bike. It was just a whole kind of congealed mass of wire and, and plastic. And, um, and I'd literally, I'd been riding hundreds and hundreds of miles of that. And, it's, and then this thing happened, and I thought, oh, God, what am I going to do? Because actually, my bike I'm pretty good with when it comes to the engine, when it comes to, I'm not, but electrics are just a mystery to me. I do not understand electrics. And I think, oh, what am I going to do? I'm in the middle of, and then I, I looked down the road and I saw this little blue sign that said auto electrician. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe it. So I wheeled my bike down uh, to this place. And, uh, and the guy's name was John, and he was from Wales. Can you believe it? <laughs> so we got out my Haynes manual, but I mean, he wasn't a motorbike mechanic, uh, a motorbike electrician, he, he, but he was just a car one. But anyway, we got my Haynes manual out, and I spent three days with him making uh, a, you know, a new wiring loom from scratch. The only problem was he only had two color wires. He only had brown and black. Um, which is still on my bike today, and it means trying to trace any kind of you know, electrical force on the bike is an absolute nightmare. Um, but anyway, it's still working, and it's still on my bike. So I managed to get across to Perth, and I travelled up through, through, through uh, uh, Indonesia uh, and Malaysia. Um, and this was a picture I took in Thailand, and I suppose it's sort of just trying to show how different it was to travel in those days. I mean, all the roadsides um, in, in, in Thailand were like that. 
And I, I had to, it took me three days in Bangkok trying to find a map of some description that actually had all the places written in Thai script and in English so I could work out where the hell I was going. And you get to like a roundabout sign and it was just all these things with all these squiggles. And I just used to have to stop and try and match them all up. Every, it, it, was, it took forever to get around Thailand. Uh, but it was brilliant. I, I mean, one thing I had was time. I had plenty of time. My limiting thing was my money. Um, but I did have plenty of time. And actually, I love Thailand. It was fantastic. Um, and this is, these are examples of the kind of maps that I did manage to find. Um, and actually, both of them are of northern Thailand. Neither of them are actually right. But if you kind of mix the two together, you can work out where you're going. But it was fun. You know, it was good. It was, it was a real, you know, it was a real adventure. Um, you really had to... You really had to work hard uh, at finding your way, and 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 also, you know, I got lost all the time. But that's when the best and most interesting things, things, you know, actually happened. Because when you get lost, you have to speak to locals. You have to get, you know, then then you get invited to stay with them, and you know, and it's just, it's that is the adventure. It's not riding the bike. Uh, it's all these extraordinary things that happen to you uh, that that, um, that makes it, uh, uh, you know, an adventure. So this, I got right to the northernmost uh, point of Thailand, despite everybody telling me, don't go up to northern Thailand, bandits in the hills, dangerous, um, which of course I ignored. And I went up to Thailand, and it was absolutely fantastic, because it was deserted. There were no tourists, because they'd all been scared off. Uh, all the locals were, 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 you know, were really happy to see me because I hadn't seen any, any other Westerners there. Um, so I had the whole place to myself and it was absolutely wonderful. So, it was a, so never always listen to what you're told by, um, by people. Um, so anyway, from so Northern Thailand, I then uh, rode back down to Penang. As I said, I tried to get through uh, Burma, um, but I couldn't. So I had to ride all the way back down to Malaysia. And it was kind of, I was in a little bit of a hurry because I needed to catch uh, the boat from Penang to Madras. And the boats only ever, I think they went like once a month. Um, and, I'd, and I'd arranged to meet my parents in Kathmandu in about two months' time. So, and it's the first time I, I was going to see that. I hadn't seen them for over a year and a half at this stage. So, uh, so I was racing down through Thailand, and that's when I had my second accident. Um, I was riding along, and this truck came the other way. And then just as the truck passed, this dog sort of shot out from behind the truck. And, uh, and I just, I don't even remember. See, it was just, I was just off. Uh, I didn't even touch the brakes. Um, and I was straight off, slid up the road, into a ditch. My bike was all, all the bits falling off it. The panniers were ripped off it. Um, and and I, it happened right outside this, this Thai farm. So all these people came out, and they were really, really kind, and they helped me get my bike out. Anyway, I ended up staying with them for about four or five days. Um, and, and I remember after the accident, because after I got up and I was all dazed, I kind of looked around for this, for this dog that I'd hit, and it had vanished, and I just couldn't understand where it had gone. I thought, I, and I was quite angry that this thing had managed to hobble off, and it had done all this damage to me. And um, anyway, then and on the last day when I was saying goodbye to the mother of the house, I went into the kitchen, and um, <laughs> there I saw the half-eaten remains. And the dog I'd run over. So I found out what I've been eating for the last, <laughs> the, last four, the last four or five days. So this was the family. And they were really sweet. They were incredible. And I didn't speak any Thai, obviously. They didn't speak any English at all. But as I say, I, I stayed you know, with them. And they helped me you know, to fix the panniers as well. And then I fixed my bike because one of the cylinders had smashed into the tree and so it was all kind of there's oil coming out everywhere so I had to strip the cylinder down and rebuild it and I think they they had never seen anything like it seeing a woman just kind of strip the cylinder, you know but, and I was you know all my hands were really because I, I I'd sadly got in, into the habit of not wearing gloves and so when I came off the bike about <laughs> up the road so all my hands so they were all bandaged up uh, and I think I'd sprained my wrist about three weeks earlier because I'd oh that's right changing a tire <laughs> 
<laughs> I had a puncture. I tried to change the toe and I slipped and I sprained my wrist. So I was not in the best and I was bruised all over and I broke my toe as well actually when I did this. But anyway, so I got back on my bike and I, and I did actually manage to catch the boat, but only because the boat was two weeks late uh, because it was an Indian run boat. So of course I needn't have worried. Um, so it was two weeks late and it turned out that the boat just had its own schedule anyway and the, and the written schedule was completely irrelevant. Uh, this boat just kind of worked its way around as it, at, at the captain's fancy, you know. So, um, so I managed to get to India and then rode up to Kathmandu, which was where I met my parents. And so I hadn't actually seen them for 18 months. And I really hoped that seeing them because they they you know I really hope that that seeing them now and I'd, I'd that I'd managed to prove to them that you know I'd got you know two-thirds of the way around the world I'd done it on my own I'd got a job in 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 you know uh, in Sydney I'd I'd managed to support myself that they'd have a little bit of interest uh, in my trip <coughs> absolutely not they didn't even look at my bike. Um, I remember when we came out of the hotel and I said, oh, do you want to see my bike? And they just didn't want to look at it. Didn't have absolutely no interest in what I was doing. They didn't ask me about my trip. Absolutely nothing. And I think at the time I was very, very hurt. But actually, I think it was my mum's way of sort of dealing with it. I think she found it very difficult to even think about what I was doing. And her way of dealing with it was to pretend almost I wasn't doing it. Um, uh, well, that's what I like to think now. Um, so uh, this was in Kathmandu. And I decided in Kathmandu actually to cut my top box down a bit. So I actually, you, you probably don't notice, but it is a little bit smaller. Um, so, and when I was in, in Kathmandu, I did a, I did a three week uh, trek uh, all around the, uh, the Annapurna circuit. Uh, and also when I was in Kathmandu, I, I met this Dutch guy called Robert, and he was the only other overland person I met on a motorbike throughout the entire two and a half years. And that just goes to show how different it was then to what it is now. Um, and so this was, this was me leaving Kathmandu, uh, which is a very unusual picture because all the pictures virtually I have up to this point are my bike in front of um, because obviously when you travel alone you don't get any pictures of yourself um, and I often get asked whether I felt uh, you know travelling as a woman was a you know was a dangerous or whether I felt and actually I did, well A it wasn't something that I thought about that much because I think if you start to think about these things then you can work yourself up into thinking of all these bad things are going to happen. But the other real advantage I had was when I was actually on the bike and I was wearing all my gear with my full face helmet, everybody assumed I was male, and especially in those days, because women didn't ride big bikes, and especially in those countries. So when I was actually on my bike, I felt relatively safe. I mean, A, you know, I could ride off anywhere and, and, and you know, ride away from trouble. But B, it was always assumed I was a bloke. Um, and there were certain countries, like when I went to, uh, you know, in some, in some Muslim countries, like Iran, I mean, I used a helmet as a, as a burqa. I just didn't take it off all day. I just, if I went to the market, I just kept my helmet on. If I went into a shop, kept my helmet on. And I just didn't take it off. And it was just much, much easier. And everybody assumed I was a bloke. And it just saved a huge amount of hassle. Um, so... I just think you have to learn how to... Uh, um, so, anyway, so I met Robert, and we then agreed to meet uh, near Agra in about three months' time, because I wanted to do a different part of India that he'd already been to. So we met up in Agra, and then we started to travel uh, together, and it was absolute... It was, it was fantastic. You know, the difference of travelling on your own to travelling with somebody... I mean, it went, I mean, I mean when I was on, on my own, it was like really, and I think it's things that you don't think of. If you get ill, 
on your own, you have to look after yourself. You've got nobody to go out and get food for you, get water for you. You've got, if you break down with your bite, you've got nobody to talk to about it. You have to fix it yourself. You have to work out the problem. You have to sort it out. You have to hope you've got spare parts with you. You know, you have to do everything alone. You have to decide where you're going to go, where you're going to stay, where you're going to eat. And it gets really tiring. And just having somebody that you could share things with made such a difference. Um, and also just having company and somebody to talk to uh, made a huge difference. Um, and also, I found India seriously hard work. Uh, I mean, this was an average... Uh, this, this was when we stopped in India. Um, within, within five minutes, that is the crowd that you had around you. And when I was on my own, and that's what I had, literally every time I stopped, within five minutes, I'd have... 30, and they're all men. You didn't see any women on the streets at all. I think this has changed now, but that's not what it was like when I was there. And it becomes exhausting, and they all just stare at you, and I did. So when I was travelling with Robert, it was 100 times easier. And this is actually Robert uh, changing a puncher. He's actually there. That's, that's him there, changing a puncher. Um, and this was a kind of early morning departure. Every time we left, this is what it was like. Every time we stopped, every time we got petrol, every, it was just, it was just, and they, it was, and I, you know, and I know they didn't, I mean, one thing with India, I never felt, uh, I, I never felt un, unsafe. Um, I never felt that they were going to do anything or anything. It was just, uh, it was just a relentless staring um, that I found quite, quite, quite hard. And people have asked me, well, if it was so awful, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just come home? And that's, and that's a, a big, big difference to what it was like travelling then to what it's like travelling now. Because now, a lot of people who do these big trips, you know, they do it in sections, they'll do America, they'll fly home, they'll then earn a bit more money, they'll fly back, they'll do the next section. That was not an option for me, because when I travelled in then, they used to write my bike in my passport. So you basically had, you, I, I was importing my bike into India or Pakistan or wherever, and it was written into your passport. I could not leave the country without my bike. So I could not just leave my bike and, and say, oh, I'm feeling a bit tired now, or I'm a bit, a bit ill, or I might just go home for a bit of an R&R. &R. You know, I couldn't do any of that. Well, the only way I was going to get home was to sit on my bike and ride it home. And that completely changes through your mental state to, uh, and your attitude to what you're doing. Um, and so it was, it was just not an option for me. And, and so if, if I got ill, I just had to get better. If, I, if my bike broke down, I just had to fix it with whatever I had in my panniers. I mean, Robert had a horrendous accident in southern India, and he was in hospital for three and a half months. And it's just nothing he could do. He was just stuck because he couldn't leave without his bike. So, you know, it is in some ways a lot easier that the fact that you can, uh, that you can um, leave your bike in, 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 you know, in, in places now. Um, so, anyway, we managed to escape the, uh, the crowded part of India and we went up to Leh and Ladakh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, this was probably one of my favourite parts, actually, of the whole journey. Uh, it was also uh, the fact that Robert and I fell in love up there, so that was very nice. Um, no, we had a fantastic time. We really did. Uh, it really was the highlight of my, of my trip. Uh, it was great. Um, and then we travelled back down, and then we tried to get out of India. We spent nearly two months getting out of India because we were there when it was the storming of the Golden Temple and in Amritsar, which was right next to the border with Pakistan. So we had a nightmare uh, trying to get out of India, which I won't go into now. Uh, but finally, we basically managed to... We used sort of forged paperwork to get out in, in the end because uh, it was the only way we, we were going to get out of the country. Uh, and then we got into Pakistan, and this was, uh, this was halfway through Pakistan, and this was a very momentous occasion, because it was the first time in over two years I saw London. <laughs> I was nearly home. It was only 900, sorry, 9,476 kilometres to go. So I was nearly home. Um, and then we rode through the deserts of 
Baluchistan, uh, and this was a pretty tough time as well because there were no roads because Russia had invaded uh, Afghanistan uh, the year beforehand, and the main overland route to India had always gone through, uh, gone sort of f f further north, and so that was all closed now. So this kind of makeshift tracks and sort of route through the desert just kind of sprung off and we just had to follow these and it was we didn't have a clue where we were going we didn't have a map we didn't have a compass we did have water though i always made sure i carried some water um and we just kind of kept heading west and we thought well if we keep heading west we will um we'll get to the border with iran um, and then we saw other, you know, puffs of smoke of other vans going through the desert, so we'd kind of follow them, and oh, anyway, so it took us a day or so to get through it. Um, and then we got to the uh, border of Iran. And when I, and I, I'm not sure, but when I was, when I was in Australia, I had to get a, uh, what's called a carnet de passage, which is like a passport for your bike, which is what they stamp your bike in and out of. As well as writing it in your passport, they also stamp your bike in and out. And the carnet de passage is, um, is basically issued by the, the, the AA. I think it's now done by the RAC, but it's, it's whatever automobile association your bike is registered at or in the country it's registered in. And so, and, and I hadn't needed one to get uh, um, um, across America, but I needed one for all of these countries after, after, I, um, after I left Australia, I needed one. So, and, the, and what you have to do is you have to put down a bond. So you have to put down money which the AA hold. And then if you don't, if you can't prove that you've got an exit stamp for every entry stamp, then the country that, that you can't, that don't have an exit stamp for, or you can't prove, then they can claim the money. So it's basically so you can't sell your bike in any of the countries. And then the countries can claim the money as like the sort of tax. Um, and the amount of bond that you have to put down, so it's quite a long complicated, but the amount of bond you have to put down depends on what countries you tell them that you're going to. And when I was in Australia, I, I sent them the list of countries and basically my carnet I had to pay £1,500 for, which was a lot of money for me. And although I was going to hopefully get the money back, it wasn't going to be till I got home. But if I included Iran, it, it was going to cost me four and a half thousand pounds, and I simply didn't have the money. So I thought, as Australia, I thought, well, Iran. I mean, I might never get there. It's miles away. Who knows what's going to happen? I might go a different route. So I thought, I won't bother to get Iran. So I didn't have Iran, and basically the countries were just listed on on the front of this document. Um, but anyway, now I was at the border with Iran. So I had the problem, and although I had a visa, so I could get in myself, my bike was technically not allowed into Iran. And this thing had been playing on my mind for months and months as I kind of edged towards the border. I thought, oh God, what am I gonna do? Um, anyway, so I got, I went into the customs room, and um, there was this you know, guy there, and I kind of handed him my carnet, sort of with the page open, sort of hoping he wouldn't notice that the Iran wasn't written on the front, but of course he did. And, uh, and he looked at me, and I just kind of smiled, and I hope that would do the trick. And, um, and then he just, um, and he just kept going like, like, like this, like on the carnet, right at, at the end of the list of countries, as if, you know, it's not here, it's not here. And I sort of tried to, anyway, he, he just kept going like that. So I went outside, and I said to Robert, I think he's telling me I should just write Iran. I should just add Iran onto the list of countries. And Robert said, well, I don't think so, but all right. So anyway, so then I went back in uh, to, to his office and I handed him my carnet again and he looked at me. And then he got his pen and he slid his pen across the table. <laughs> and as he slid it across the table, he looked out of the window. <laughs> so I picked up his pen and I carefully added Iran onto the list of the countries. And then he turned back, I handed him my carnet, and he stamped it, and he handed it to me, and with a big smile on his face. So, it just shows you can never tell. So, um, so then I was given seven days to ride through Iran, uh, which was quite tough, because I got hepatitis right in the middle of it. 
So I had to ride my bike with hepatitis, which was not much fun. Um, and then we got into Turkey and then rode through Turkey and Greece, Yugoslavia and back to London. Um, now, this was my maintenance schedule that I kept throughout my trip. And I was very, very good at looking after my bike, I have to say. I knew that if she was going to get me home, I would have to look after her, and I did. So I religiously changed the oils. I checked her, not every day, but, you know, I, every few days I checked her over, um, and I changed the oil filter, everything, air filter. But I was really good at looking after her, and, uh, and she, she got me home, and I still ride her today. Um, so these are some of the maps that I, that I used uh, along the way, which I still have. Um, uh, this is my Haynes manual, which, <laughs> which I still have and I still use. Uh, it's full of all these little notes that I made uh, around the, uh, on my journey. Uh, and when I got back, I, I found it extremely difficult to adjust. Um, I was really depressed. Um, I'd gone from this incredibly exciting uh, life on the road and where everything was just, you know, it was just so amazing and you, you sort of lived a whole lifetime in a week sometimes with all these amazing and difficult things. I mean, not always good, but it was, it was very intense. Um, and suddenly I came home and it was all just bleh. And also the fact that none of my family had any interest in my journey and nobody could really understand what I'd done and I had nobody to talk to. The only person I had in the whole world I could talk to who understood what I'd been through was, you know, was, was, was Robert. And he was in Holland. Um, but we did you know, stay in touch and we did see each other. Um, you know, a lot, but it was still really, really uh, hard. Um, but I went back and uh, finished off my architecture training um, for another two years. Um, and I also, uh, that's what, this was my bike when I managed to get it home. Um, but I needed, so, but I decided to, that I would completely strip her down uh, and rebuild her as she'd uh, showed me very good service for two and a half years. Um, so I started out and I literally uh, completely, completely stripped her down. <laughs> and I did manage to get her back together again. Um, so I d went back and did my architecture. Uh, and then when I was still uh, uh, at college or at uni, I found... Um, I found my next project, which was a, a derelict Victorian water tower. Um, so I decided to take quite a big risk. I had to buy it at auction without planning or listed building consent or anything. Um, and the local planning authority were pretty discouraging. They basically said, we'll never give you planning to turn it into a house, which of course I ignored. And um, I thought I will find a way. So I bought it at auction. And I then spent another year and a half uh, fighting the local council. I had to go to appeal, and I won on appeal. But that's one thing I learned on my journey. If you want something enough, and you are, and you just don't, you know, you just go on and on and on and on until you get it. You will get there. And and uh, and they and they just put problem after problem after problem after. And I just every one I just managed to solve. I got around it. I just dealt with it in a different way. So I learned a lot of valuable lessons on my round-the-world trip. So after I got planning, I then spent the next seven years uh, converting the building, and I did a lot of the building work myself um, because I was, uh, I think I just, I think I just, just after I bought it, I finished, and then I had to do my, my work experience for a year, so I wasn't earning very much money. So I had to do a lot of work myself. Uh, but this is the tower today. That's the living room at the top. Um, so it's basically six, six rooms um, with a roof terrace. And that's the living room at the top. That's the tower completed where I, I still... And I've been there, it's hard to believe, I bought it 32 years ago. Um, that's my kitchen. That's one of the bedrooms. Um, and that's the tower where she stands. Um, 
No, she's an amazing building, actually. Absolutely amazing. It, it's when, uh, yeah, when buildings were built by craftsmen. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so now, and now I'm on a whole other journey. So after my book was published in 2017, uh, this was my book launch, which was at Vines uh, in Guildford. Um, and this was, and I'm also in the BMW 90 year uh, book and Charlie and Ewan don't even get a mention and I get four, I get four pages. <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was very pleased about that. So, um, um, but I've had the most fantastic time over the last few, few years. So the book was published in 2017 and I've been invited, this I was invited out to, to, um, uh, to Italy uh, uh, where I was did this night ride through the streets of Milan. I was interviewed on, on the TV there. This was me in America in 2018, because my book was published uh, uh, out there in 2018. So I've done, I did two, two book tours of the States. Uh, this, was, uh, oh, this was amazing. This was um, this, this uh, BMW shop. Uh, actually, they made a complete replica of my bike. Um, sorry, I'll go back. They made a complete replica of my bike. And when I got there, it was sitting there. And I actually started crying. It was just, you know, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it with all its boxes on for nearly for 35 years or whatever. It was extraordinary. Um, so, and apparently that's now in the, uh, you know, museum. Um, and, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, and then, and then lots of other trips. I've never stopped travelling. Uh, I've been to, uh, I've been to Tibet. Uh, last year, I was, uh, yeah, no, in 2018, I was invited to join a trip. Uh, 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 Ten women riding in 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 northern Pakistan uh, to uh, uh, empower the Pakistani women. We were teaching them how to ride motorbikes. We were visiting schools. So it was fantastic. It was really, really good. Um, and then that's for them teaching them to ride motorbikes, and they were really good. I tell you, they were really, they were really, really good and really keen and enthusiastic. Um, and then that's the last picture, which is basically uh, my bike, which I did get back together again, and uh, my water tower. So thank you very much. What a story. <laughs> Talk about effort equals results. That really is a story to revel in. I'm sure there are questions that would like to come to Elspeth. Who would like to kick off with uh, some relevant right, questions? Let me just bring the mic over. Yes. OK, Elspeth, you haven't mentioned accommodation. Was it a tent or luxury hotel? Oh, or? it was five-star hotels, the whole no. <laughs> um, I, it's When I started off, um, I carried a tent in... America and New Zealand and Australia, because they were perfect camping uh, countries. Um, I and I camped a lot uh, through because that was obviously the cheapest uh, way for me. Uh, after I left Australia, I posted my tent home, and then I pretty much because it was so cheap to stay in hostels and things in the Far East and in India. So I just didn't bother with a tent. Uh, then when I met with Robert, he had a tent. So we started camping, uh, uh, you know, again. But we didn't camp every night. It was very much, but it was quite handy to have a tent because often we, you know, we just couldn't find places to stay. Um, but we, yeah. So it would be just a cheap, a cheap hostel uh, or we'd, or we'd tent uh, from India, Pakistan, all the way back home. What was the favourite country that you travelled to? Oh, I loved New Zealand. Absolutely loved New Zealand. Uh, I loved Northern Thailand. Uh, I loved uh, Nepal. I'm a kind of... I like mountains. I like being high up, hence living in the town. Um, but I do like... Yeah, I do like mountains. And, and I loved Leh and Ladakh. Um, yeah, I mean, there were bits of every country, to be honest. There were parts of America, I mean, riding through, 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 you know, sort of, sort of Arizona and Utah, and I mean, this stunning scenery, 
Um, so there were kind of bits of each country that, um, that I enjoyed, but I would say mainly the mountains. Um, Spirit of Adventure against kind of your campaign to keep the bike going and... and precise. Yeah, precise. precise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually a very organised person and I, and I was quite obsessional about my bike. Um, I mean, even now, I can't... You know, if, if I can hear a, a loose, you know, valve or something, I, I, I can't, you know, I've got to fix it. There's something about... I just like to know that everything's working as it should. I don't like to feel anything is being stressed or isn't right. And that's just, I know, it's a slightly weird, but it's slightly obsessional. But, um, but yet then when it came to where I was going, I didn't, it didn't really matter. And so I suppose it's, it's I, I, I suppose I concentrated and focused on what was important. And for me, keeping my bike going was my lifeline. Um, you know, if I, if, I, if I lost my bike or I couldn't get it going, I was completely stuck. And so it was my absolute lifeline, my bike. A question from me. Oh, goodness me, so many people. Um, why did you choose a BMW? I think the obvious answer is, but God. Because they're me. the best. No. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, I mean, I didn't actually, when I was buying my BMW, I didn't buy it to, I'm going to ride this around the world. Um, but, you know, in the early 80s with motorbikes, there wasn't really a lot of choice. I mean, now you, there's a vast range of these adventure bikes you can ride, you, you can buy. But really, in those days, there was the BMWs, which were kind of way ahead. I mean, they were three times as expensive as most other bikes. You then ha ha had the Jap bikes. Well, the Japanese bikes hadn't really come up with any sort of adventure or, or long-distance you know, they were all into the smaller bikes, you know, the 250s sure. or the... Well, that's not true, actually, they did it. But they were all... They just weren't kind of adventure travel bikes and they weren't that well made. Uh, and then there was, uh, you know, the Nortons and the Triumphs, yeah. which you had to... Good job constant... you didn't choose those. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, fuel supplies as you travelled on your journey, was there any problem? I just... You didn't have a clue where the next petrol station was. I mean, certain... I mean, like, in Australia was probably the hardest because the roadhouses were, like, three, four hundred miles apart. Australia, actually, was the only country I carried fuel. Um, and, obviously, when I went to one roadhouse, I would, I would say to them, when's the next one? And then, when's the next one? So I would always ask... tanks? No, I... I mean, my, my, my tank, I... I I put that tank on before I left because when, when I bought my bike, I just had a three-gallon tank, and that that tank I bought for twenty quid, and it's a five-gallon. And my bike could do about sixty-five miles to the gallon if I was if I was gentle. Um, so I had a range of about three hundred and twenty miles, which wasn't too bad. And if I carried an extra gallon, that you know, um, extra fuel, that took it up to about four hundred miles. And the rest of it, I just always tried to make sure. If I was like half empty, I would just start looking for petrol stations. And then I would just always kind of keep it as topped up as I could. But the only place I ran out of fuel was when I was... I just got into Iran, which actually was ironical, because Iran was... A, the petrol was, was eight pence a gallon. <laughs> it was the only place I ran out. Um, the gentleman here says the quality of the photographs that you had throughout your journey were extremely good how did you oh, yes. how did you manage to do it <laughs> uh well i had a and also did, did, did you wait till the end to get them all developed, or get them all developed? okay did you get them developed on the way or when you got home uh, very good question uh well i had a pentax k1000 camera and um i basically i would do one country and then i would uh get the films uh um, then, so, so like when I got to, to you know, so, sort of, sort of, you know, um, end of America, I would take the films in, I would get them developed, and then I would send. First of all, I would send the prints home, and then when I'd heard that the prints had arrived, I then sent the negatives. So I didn't send them both together. I sent them in two separate, two separate batches. Exactly. Um, but the problem really when I, so but after I left Australia and got in, into the Far East and in India, the problem was actually finding film. 
um, because a lot of the film uh, had been, was really it was years old. It was years out of date. It had been in a kind of window, in a shop window, in the boiling sun for years. Or I mean, it was just you couldn't guarantee it. So I remember when I was in Singapore, I managed to get nine rolls of film, and uh, and that's no. When I was in when I left Southeast. Literally, I had nine rolls of film to see me all the way home. And it really makes you think about the frame you take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I would walk half a mile just to get a slightly better angle. And I'd get it all, and I'd, get, and I'd spend like 10 minutes getting it all perfectly in focus, and I'd go click. And that was, and I used to count down. I knew exactly how many pictures I had left. And I that's another slight obsession, probably. But I knew exactly how many pictures I had left. I had new homes. And then I had to carry all my films um, all the way home from India to home. Nope. Did you carry a spare tyre unless nope. anyone had? I, I carried inner tubes. So I had uh, inner tube for both back and front. But I only, had, I only had the one puncher. Can you believe it? I know, it's extraordinary. Throughout the entire 35,000 miles, I had one puncher. So. Right, another question, Elspeth, is a uh, gentleman here wants to know, can he have the royalties from the film that you're going to make? Oh. <laughs> he didn't actually ask that question, but he said, what is the possibility of the film? Uh, well, I, I, I have signed an agreement with these two producers in LA uh, as of the end of last year. So it's really early days, and I'm not, certainly not holding my breath. The whole film in industry is a unto itself. Um, I think it's got a small percent chance it might happen, but you have to get a lot of things all in the right place at the right time. You've got to get the money, you've got to get the interest, you've got to get the actors, you've got to, you know, it's all got to happen at the right time. So I don't know. I, I'm certainly, I'm not, you know, it might happen. It might happen. Well, they seem to think it's a good story, yeah. and they're and they're thinking about doing like a you know like a TV series, like a Netflix or Amazon or H HBO. Okay, um, another before I move on, there's one person that I'd like to personally thank. The reason you're here, Elspeth, is Peter Miller, who um, introduced <laughs> me to the concept of you coming along this evening about a year ago. So thank you, Peter, for uh, introducing us. Round of applause. Thank you. Right, apart from inner tubes, what spares did you take with you? Weren't you concentrating when I, when I had my list up? <laughs> um, well, I carried uh, plugs, well, off the top of my head, um, I carried uh, plugs, uh, HT leads, uh, gaskets, seals, cables, um, fuses, a load of electrical spare bits that I never really knew what to do with, but I carried them anyway. Um, oh, God, I can't remember. Uh, points, points, I carried spare points. Um, yeah, one of the cylinders, because when I, when I came off uh, on the, it, basically this, the, the bike kind of reared across the road, went into a ditch, and then the, the, the tree kind of, it, it caught the tree, and it kind of broke the base gasket. So all the oil was kind of um, coming out of the base gasket, so I had to strip the whole thing. The cylinder survived, yeah. I mean, it's always it's a leaked. BMW. It's a BMW, exactly. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, I basically had a basic set of tools, and you can strip that bike down with a basic set of tools. I needed, I think, two special tools, one for the flange to get the exhaust uh, flange off, and, uh, and one other tool for the steering head bearings, and that's it. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Mm. A question from uh, way down the hall. Did you have a pet name for the bike? No. <laughs> I just used to call her my girl. Okay. And overall, how much do you think the cost of the trip was? Well, I left with two and a half thousand uh, pounds. I left Sydney with 6,000 US dollars and I came back with 1,000. So I don't know what the exchange rates were then. But I always like to have this 1,000 in, you know, in the back of my pocket because I didn't, or not literally, but because I, I, you needed to have 
uh, you know, like a reserve, because if I had an accident and I en ended up being, in, you know, stuck somewhere for a month or two months, I needed this sort of emergency money. So I liked, always liked to hold back a thousand dollars in case I had this catastrophe that I had to deal with in some way. Um, what's the current mileage on the bike now? And secondly, have you any other machines that you own? <laughs> Uh, well, the mileage on the bike now, well, the clock, or the odometer, uh, says just over 100,000, but the speedo broke umpteen times, so I don't actually know. Um, and I do have, I have three other motorbikes. I've got another BMW uh, R80 GS Basic, which is a 1998, which is actually the last of the airheads. And what's great about that is I can still service it, I can still work on it. And I don't have, it's not full of electronics like all these modern bikes. Uh, and then I've got two little off-road off bikes as well. I've got a Yamaha Cerro and a Beta Alp. Okay. One question. Did you ride the bike here this evening? I had to carry all my books, which I hope you're going to... <laughs> no, I the hope answer I should sell. be yes, of course you did. Um, subsequent question was how difficult... I know, well, I threw them away. I threw my panniers away. Yeah, well, but after 10 years of having them in my attic in London, and nobody wanted to know about my journey, and I was doing my architecture, I think I bought the... It was actually when I was moving out of London to move into the water tower. And, and I looked at these panniers, and I thought, well, never get stuff about this anymore. I'm never going to use them again. And they were quite big and bulky. Um, and so I just put them on a skip. I know, it's one of the things I... You need to get them ready for the film. Um, well, I'm hoping another, that they're going to make Elspeth, them. another question at the back here. We'll do a couple more. Um, how difficult was it to get the Carnet Passage? Carnet de Passage, passage yeah. Uh, it wasn't that difficult. You pay your money and they give, and they give it to you. It wasn't that difficult. Um, I, mean, for, I mean, actually, it was, my, it was the one time that my, that my dad stepped, stepped in to help because I was in Sydney then, and uh, it had to be organised from the AA in Basingstoke. And in those days, you know, you, could, you, 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 you had to fax things or, or phone, and there was all the time difference trying to... It was just a nightmare. So my dad actually stepped in and helped me organise it. But, I mean, it took about a month or something, but I think you just, you just had to go through the paperwork. So. I've got a question from a gentleman from the Department of Transport here. <laughs> Who said, um, what did you do for insurance, MOT and road tax? <laughs> well, I can say I had no insurance, no M MOT and no road tax for uh, two and a half years. <laughs> Best question of the evening, I think. Sorry. What make of time? What make of time? Well, when I started out off, I was kind of religiously having continentals. Um, but I soon realised that actually anything, as long as it's round and it holds air, and it's, that's it, that's all you need. So I think I ended up with Yokohama's on it, which... I know. Uh, yes, but I, I think I had the continental on when I, when I had the puncture. Um, but the, yeah, and then I had Yokohama's. But literally, my tyres were bald. I mean, you could see the canvas. Because after I left, after I left Southeast Asia, I couldn't get a tyre again until I got to Turkey. So I did all that on the same tyre. And uh, the, it was literally it was down to the canvas. Final question, uh, Elspeth, is from a young lady over there that says, "With all the money you carried, where did you keep it?" <laughs> in my in my money belt, strapped to my waist. In uh, American Express travellers checks, well, which actually were very good because because they were very good for um, exchanging on the black market. Everybody wanted American Express on the black market, so I got very good good rate for them. Okay, ladies, and I'm going to hand you back to Rob now. Unless there's any final question, I hand you back to Rob Rennie. Thank you. Thank you. So many words come to mind, Elspeth, about this wonderful evening. We've all enjoyed it so much. I jotted a few things down as we were unrolling. It was charged with so many emotions and challenges. You've got a can-do culture. Your sheer determination came through so strongly. 
against all the adversities that were thrown at you. It's been an amazing story and clearly the journey of a lifetime. It was indeed. Thank you so much for sharing it with us all tonight. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, one little postscript. The book that's been much referred to is available at the back. And I will sign it for you. And Elspeth will sign it for you. There's a special offer.